The Hero's Journey. What do great films like The Godfather, Titanic, Terminator, Indiana Jones, Rocky, Toy Story, Shrek, The Lion King, Forrest Gump, Gladiator, The Matrix, and Jaws have in common? Or novels like Le Miserable, Don Quixote, The Count of Monte Cristo, The Three Musketeers, Crime and Punishment, Anna Karenina. Fairy tales like Cinderella, Snow White, Little Red Riding Hood, The Big Friendly Giant. Or epic adventure stories like The Jungle Book, The Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. What do they all have in common? Their structure, their backbone. All these stories and millions more from all latitudes of the globe follow a sequence of events known as the hero's journey. Think of your favorite film, novel, play, or short story. You will find the hero's cycle, the hero's journey there. For this is ingrained in our psyche in the deepest of ways. There is a 12-step sequence that appears time after time in every story worth remembering. 12 steps in three stages, separation, initiation, and return of the hero. We will talk about these 12 steps today, and we will see them play out in real life, which is why this is important knowledge for all of us. In this life, we are all called to be heroes, whether we like it or not. Whether we have the guts to succeed or not, we are all the inevitable hero or coward of our own story. This is fabulous news for every mature and responsible person, because we can all create our own story and be the hero in it. Bravo! Ah, but freedom comes at an exceedingly high price, with a vast cosmic responsibility. And that's why we don't all want to create our own story and be the heroes of that story. Many people prefer to elect dictators to power so the dictator takes decisions for them. Thousands of people are shouting in the streets in a city near you who prefer to blame someone else for everything that happens to them, who prefer to identify themselves as victims rather than heroes. Thanks to cultural Marxism, millions of beautiful people who could be great heroes reduce themselves to victims and put all their precious energy into accusing and denouncing evils without, instead of creating strength and beauty within. Freedom makes us responsible for all our actions and decisions, but it will always be easier to blame someone else for our failures and mediocrity. It's men. It's the church. It's capitalism. It's white people. It's heterosexuals. Instead of unequivocally assuming responsibility for our failures and mediocrity, we all need to grow up. But not all of us are interested in growing up. Why come out of the chrysalis, which is a difficult and painful process, if we can always try to stay in it, at the price of never ceasing to be caterpillars, which is perhaps a comfortable but certainly suicidal option. I am thrilled that you are committed to personal growth, and that's why you're still here with me. You're a hero, as am I, and all of us who are willing to get out of bed and fully wake up. It always feels more comfortable to stay under the warm blankets dozing off. But we will not find any treasure or knowledge there. To live, we need to get out of bed. We will always have to cross a river. So what is the hero's journey? As I said, it consists of 12 steps in three stages, and we will follow the trail of three extraordinary stories the Lord of the Rings, the Matrix, and Harry Potter, to make every step more evident. 1. The Ordinary World, or Status Quo. The world as it was grey and dull until the adventure begins. All the familiar and ordinary things that have always surrounded us. 
What did things look like before we embarked on an adventure? That is the status quo, and it must die if we're ever going to grow up. In The Lord of the Rings, Frodo lives happily enough and is about to become a millionaire, actually, because his uncle Bilbo Baggins is leaving him his enormous fortune. In The Matrix, Neo is very dissatisfied with his life, but he has a job after all and is making some progress on his own. In Harry Potter, Harry still lives with his uncles and hates his life, but at least everything follows a familiar and therefore predictable order. There are no nasty surprises. 2. The Call to Adventure A stranger comes to call us to leave our world. This must be an unequivocal clarion call because we'll have to leave everything and the world will never be the same again. Gandalf arrives to call Frodo to hide and destroy the ring. Neo begins to receive messages and a white rabbit appears. And on the phone he hears a disturbing voice that saves him from the thugs who have come to execute him. Harry Potter receives a visit from Hagrid and an invitation to Hogwarts, the wizarding school. These are things that can't just be ignored. 3. Rejection of the call No one likes having to change. It is in our instinct to resist change. Even if we reject the call, we will forever be marked in our hearts as cowards, defeated, spineless wimps who had the opportunity to change their lives and were too afraid to do it. Often there is in this call some unknown, even supernatural element. The call may be a voice, a strange door or place we have not crossed until today, some premonition or intuition of something about to happen or something that we must do. Frodo and his friends hesitate as they have to cross the river that inevitably separates them from their world. Neo refuses to jump out of the window, as Morpheus instructs him to do. In Harry Potter, the refusal is that of his aunt and uncle, who destroy all letters from Dumbledore and the wizarding school. 4. The mentor appears! Hallelujah! Someone who knows what the heck is going on and is willing to help us. We crossed the river, the threshold, and beyond we find a mentor. We enter a strange new world where we have no friends, no certainties, no knowledge. Being lost and anxious, Frodo meets Strider, who has the warrior skills required from that point in the journey. Neo meets Morpheus, who reveals to him the truth about the Matrix. Harry Potter enters the magical world of his parents in Diagon Alley, where he acquires the tools of a wizard for the first time. 5. We now have crossed the first threshold, the river, the first frontier, and found the mentor. But we are in an entirely new and unknown landscape. All rules have changed. Now there are only adventures, dangers, and riddles ahead. And it still hurts every time we remember the safety and familiarity of the home we left behind. Frodo has abandoned the comfort and protection of his life in the Shire. Neo chooses to take the red pill and leave the domain of the machines forever, even if it costs him his life. Harry has two private interviews with Dumbledore, and his fate is sealed. He'll never be the same after that. 6. And if we are drafting a novel, a play, or a film script, this is the beginning of Act 2, The Initiation. We are exposed and vulnerable in dangerous territory, and will have to find mentors and allies in the struggle. Otherwise, we won't survive, because dangers we never imagined will crop up, and enemies we never knew we had will appear along the way. 7. The Test What do you think? Everything up to this point has just been preparations. Now we're really going to face the test because we must enter the very lair of the enemy. This is a near-death experience of depression, disillusionment, bewilderment. This 
location. We temporarily lose our north and south, our place in the physical and social sphere, our foothold in the world. Frodo must climb the most desolate mountains while the ring weighs him down and threatens him more at each step. Neo sees the enemy penetrate the rebel's lair, intent on destroying everyone and everything. Harry faces countless trials to reach the Philosopher's Stone. 8. We are stranded, anchorless and rudderless in the middle of the ocean, in the equatorial stupor that is every sailor's worst enemy. At his weakest point in the story, Frodo faces the crucial moment when he must destroy the ring or be destroyed by it. Neo faces his final duel and struggle. Harry comes face to face with Voldemort, who is Satan. 9. But by surviving this pit, by emerging alive from this mire, from this cave, from this exasperating paralysis, we will have acquired or learned something new. This new knowledge is the treasure we wrested from the darkness. It almost cost us our life to obtain it, but that treasure gained is now our source of life and energy. Frodo returns from the apocalyptic battle of Minas Tirith with his friends to crown the new and legitimate king. Neo discovers that he can control the world of the Matrix. Harry is wounded but awakens in the infirmary to realize the magnitude of his victory. <sighs> but we can't rest yet. Ten. And this would be act three and final in your novel or play. We flee, pursued by the monster or enemy who wants to snatch the treasure from our hands and destroy us before we share the treasure with others. We'll have to use all the knowledge gained along the way to survive this final fight. In The Lord of the Rings, we see the healing of the Shire. In The Matrix, we see the return to the real world, out of the illusion of the Matrix. In Harry Potter, the world is freer and brighter, and everyone is safe after Voldemort has died. 11. And here at last the victory begins, with the crossing of the threshold of return, which is resurrection. Frodo experiences several resurrections, in fact. When the wraiths that pursued them wounded him, when he was bitten by the spider, when he finally destroyed the ring. In a beautiful inversion of the Sleeping Beauty story, Neo becomes Sleeping Beauty and is resurrected, awakened, with the help of God himself, because what was the name of the beautiful woman who accompanies him everywhere? Ah, yes, Trinity. Hmm. Harry achieves victory for his family and his community, which is the House of Gryffindor. Twelve. Now, at last, we regain our throne. We sit in the place of authority we always knew was ours. We have defeated the enemy. We have brought safely with us the secret or elixir that will save our community. A new order begins, for against all odds, we have succeeded in returning home with the Holy Grail, the unheard of treasure. There is a new status quo, because we completed the cycle, but in a spiral. That is to say, we're several curls or cycles above from where we started. And the next adventure will start from here, because this is now the new state to school, and the adventure never ends, nor should it ever end. The call to the next adventure only sharpens and renews itself, as do we. Having triumphed over this world, Frodo does not stay at home but crosses the grey gates and sets out with the elves for the undying lands, where his injuries will heal forever. Neo is confirmed as the savior of humanity. Harry returns home at last, and this is now, for the first time, a home, having recovered his parents' inheritance, knowing who he is, and what and how varied and great his magical powers are. We 
all cross this hero's path every time we undertake something big and every time life forces us to respond to unforeseen situations. As Joseph Campbell says, if we remember that the hero's journey is a cycle, we will be better prepared not to give up before we complete the cycle. This will help us endure the moments of hardship, find ourselves a mentor, protect ourselves from the enemies that will invariably appear. It will motivate us to find allies. Only when we remember that the hero's journey is a cycle will we move forward without being discouraged when we face a crisis and when we suffer attacks and discover new enemies. We must go through life knowing that this will inevitably happen along the way in the world of the hero. If we stay in the ordinary world, we never achieve anything noteworthy, nothing extraordinary, nothing memorable. Life demands and imposes on us to do something extraordinary to get ahead. Oh, but how many distractions <laughs> appear on the hero's path. It's as if as soon as we set foot on the path, a thousand zombies jump out and grab our ankles so as not to let us take another step. Or as if strange roots twine around our legs to make us give up and remain that unchanged, ignored, and gray, ignorant, and gray citizen who has never left his house and therefore will never get the reward nor the hand of the princess let alone the keys to the kingdom. The hero's path, the hero's journey, is like a path of slippery, unstable rocks that we must cross to reach the other side of a river, because the river is the border to the special world where the treasure we need to acquire is. And out of the water, mermaid hands emerge and grab our ankles and sing a seductive melody, to take us down with them. Or even worse, but more familiar, sadly, the hands holding us are those of people who drowned before trying to cross over too, and now they don't want anyone else to achieve what they couldn't achieve. Unless we make a colossal, concerted effort, the tentacles of the octopus of mediocrity We'll coil around our ankles to ensure that we never cross the mythical river, the border, into the land where the treasure is. We must learn not to fear or be surprised by the appearance of these zombies, sirens, roots, or tentacles that paralyze us. We must understand that they will inevitably appear because that's how hard life is but that we can shake them off every time because that's how glorious life is. All worthwhile projects in this world are like this. That's what our most profound dreams and longings point towards. They are on the other side of the river, over there, on the opposite shore, and unless we cross that river, we will never reach them. We always have a river to cross. But let's not be discouraged. The fact that these dreams beat in our hearts and keep calling and pushing us to action is evidence that they are part of our innermost identity, that they are already in our DNA, that they are already ours in that sense, and it is up to us to go and rescue them. Our dreams tell us who we are. They point towards our identity. Our dreams are a treasure that we once had because no one can desire what they do not know, and that we must now recover to be at peace, to be whole again. We must recover ourselves in our dreams to stop being divided and incomplete and become one with ourselves once again. We are heroes because it is up to us to go out as heroes to recover our treasure, that throne which is ours, and which is temporarily in the hands of another, but which we can reconquer. Such is the story of Cinderella, whose stepmother and stepsisters had stolen what was hers, but who in the end regains her position as the true mistress of the house. Such is the story of Snow White, or the Greek mythical hero Jason, regaining their rightful throne after surviving the ordeal. For Jason, 
Cinderella and Snow White were the rightful heirs to the fortune and the throne, but they had to regain it by proving their courage, their metal, their virtue, and truest identity on overcoming the trials. Let us go ahead, then. Let us behave like the heroes we are to recover the treasure, the kingdom, the throne that we long for because it has always been ours. Let us regain the vast latitude and light that belongs to us because it is already within us. And yes, I'm not just talking now about our daily battles, but about the ultimate battle, the one against the mightiest enemies, death and evil, the cosmic battle, because we have to face that battle too. But this battle is, of course, too big for us to fight alone. For all our merits and good intentions, it would be like pitting the earth against a gigantic black hole in outer space. No contest. One of the countless excellences of the Christian worldview is that we get to see ourselves as the beautiful princess held in a tower by the ogre, and Christ as the hero who's willing to put his life on the line to rescue us. Just ponder how awesome that is. You and I are the treasure he set out to recover. We are the treasure. And as the ultimate hero, Christ was willing to sacrifice himself for us. Mohammed never did that for Muslims. Buddha didn't do that for Buddhists. Mohammed and Buddha are not heroes because they never sacrificed for their own followers, let alone for the rest of us. Christ did. And for everyone, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, and even atheists and Satanists. The Christian perspective, which I thoroughly commend to you, is that the tyrant who temporarily usurped our place to rule this kingdom that is ours is called Satan, and he's already defeated. It is up to us to go out and reclaim as heroes what Christ has won for us. We must think of ourselves as heroes because we are heroes, at least of our own story. And what do you think? We are inevitably also the hero or the ogre of the story of our children, our marriage, our family, and our community. So how do we forge ourselves as heroes? We must cross a river every day. One, we must do something heroic every day. And this heroic act can be a conversation we've been putting off, a decision we haven't made, a reaching out to someone, seeking a mentor, finding allies, something, anything that takes us out of our ordinary world, away from what we do automatically every day. A heroic act we do without being asked paid or applauded for it. That is a heroic act. Anything we do because our heart and conscience tells us to, and no one must pay us or cheer us on for doing it. A hero does not depend on applause, on payment or credit for his heroic act. You and I are heroes because we are heroes, not because we are paid or applauded for what we do. Two, We must remember our true face, that face that is there behind all the masks that we use sometimes to hide, that brave and luminous being that we are as we cross the river. Let's visit and revisit every day whatever inspires us most to be heroes, no matter how much people and political correctness scream at us to look somewhere else or do otherwise. We must connect and reconnect with this inspiration. That is what will make us great. 
Everything else traps us in our mediocrity, even if we get paid for it and the multitudes applaud as we walk past. Let's wake up. If everyone is complimenting and applauding us, we are on everyone else's path, which is the wrong path for us. 3. We must speak up. Raise our voice for others. A hero is willing to sacrifice him or herself to protect his family and community. If we see evil, we must stand up to evil. If we see an injustice, we must speak up. If we see good people being abused and persecuted, we cannot allow ourselves to remain paralyzed and silent because that turns us into accomplices. As it's been said before, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And you and I are much more than good people. We are heroes. Thank you for listening. I'm Gabriel Porras, professional voiceover artist. Visit me at gabrielvoice.com and radiantwhispers.com and let's go cross that river and be heroes every day. Every day.